I want to turn to the topic of the day, uh, medical trade wars, the search for drugs, devices, and PPE. This is the second of what will be 10 training programs on global trade issues. Um, this is sponsored by the Heinrich, Heinrich Foundation. Um, we are going to have uh, experts from all over the all over the globe talking about different aspects of of global supply chains and primarily how they're affecting been affected by and reacting to coronavirus. Um, today we're talking, as I said, about medical issues. Um, you know, since the start of COVID nineteen, we've battled <coughs> shortages of simple protect, protective agreements, runs on on hydroxychloroquine that impacted the availability of existing users to access it and fears that ventilator shortages would doom many COVID patients in overwhelmed hospitals. Uh, that the medical supply chain is, issues are happening in the US, a nation that spends a greater share of its economy on healthcare than anybody else is alarming. Our technology and research advances and our surgeons are the best in the world, but we can't supply hospitals with little cloth masks. That's one of the things we're going to get in today. Our three experts will lead us through supply chain issues that bedevil, bedevil drugs, devices, and other medical supplies. We'll, uh, we're joined by Rosemary Gibson, author of China RX, Sebastian Mirado of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and Gary Jureffi, director of the Global Value, the Global Value Chains Center at Duke University. First up, we're going to go to Rosemary. She's a senior advisor at the Hastings Center, a biomedical think tank. She's also the author of, as I said, China RX, Exposing the Risks of America's Dependence on China for Medicine, which gets to the heart of looming problems in the pharmaceutical supply chain. Each of our speakers will talk for seven or eight minutes. A couple of them will have slideshows that they'll be showing you. Um, after we've heard from all of our speakers, we will, we will turn it over to Q&A. If you wanna ask a question, you'll see the little raise my hand button at the bottom. Raise your hand and you can ask an audio question. When it's time, I'll call on you and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question to one or all three of the panelists. You can also submit questions by text. Um, and so as those questions are com coming in, we'll be looking at them and we will get to as many of those as we can during the program. So once again, I wanna thank uh, Rosemary for joining us today. I'm gonna turn the floor over to you now. Uh, the topic is US dependence on China for medicine. The content here would be applicable to most countries around the world. Next slide, please. As Chris mentioned, uh, this work is the result of three years of research that culminated in China RX. Next slide, please. I'll make four points today. How dependent is the United States on China for medicine? What is FDA not telling us? How did we become dependent? It's more than just lower costs. And what are the risks? Interruptions in supply, shortages, and quality problems. Next slide, please. This is a, a piece from an industry trade press in 2012. Dangers aside, drug makers can't live with Chinese APIs. That means active pharmaceutical ingredients. It what makes, it's what makes a medicine, medicine. Without API, there's no medicine. So this has been happening for a very long period of time. Next slide, please. How dependent are we? This is a testimony from an official from the Defense Department to the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission last summer, who said, the national security risks of increased Chinese dominance of the global API market cannot be overstated. Next slide. This is testimony at the House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee last year by Michael Wessel, a member of the commissioner on the US-China Commission, who said China is the world's largest supplier of these core ingredients, APIs. Next slide, please. This is a letter from the, a bipartisan letter from senators to the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, uh, discussing the Defense Department's dramatic dependence on China and they were calling for a meeting with the Defense Department to move forward on what should be done. Next slide, please. What is the FDA not telling us? Uh, this is uh, data from FDA testimony to the House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee last summer. And the way the data is portrayed, it appears as if the US is not too dependent on China. On the left side is the number of API manufacturing facilities 
And it looks like China doesn't have that many facilities compared to the US, so it doesn't seem to look very bad. And on the right side is the percentage of API manufacturing facilities. And once again, it appears as if China's not dominant. Next slide, please. Here's what the FDA doesn't tell us. This is the, we have to look at the tip of the triangle. At the bottom, we have the finished drugs, the pills that we take, the vials of medicines. They're made with the active ingredients, what we talked about, what makes the medicine medicine. FDA regulates the API facilities and finished drugs. But what the FDA is not telling us is where, where do APIs come from? They don't fall from the sky. They're made with raw materials and chemical intermediates, molecules. And this is where China has dominant global market share. These are called key starting materials. And the FDA doesn't tell us this information because it doesn't know, because it doesn't regulate them. And if it doesn't regulate them, it doesn't count the facilities. But this is globally where China is dominant. And how do we know that? Next slide, please. Again, what are these key starting materials? There are thousands of them. They're molecules, raw materials, antibiotic fermentation plants from pigs. And companies keep this information like Fort Knox, a closely guarded secret. Next slide. I'll just say I've seen these, what I call regrettable statements, where the US Chamber of Commerce says that the US manufacturers already meet 70% of pharmaceutical demand came out earlier this month. They can't meet that demand without uh, dependence on China for thousands of the core components, these raw materials and starting materials. Next slide. So what do we know about the sourcing of these key starting materials? Next slide. India depends on China for 69% of what it needs for its huge generic industry. And we know that from the India Directorate of Commercial Intelligence and Statistics, which reported that earlier this year. Next slide. Uh, this is, uh, from, came out earlier this month from a, um, a, a PhD chemist who works in the industry on the branded side. And he says, right now, it's even difficult to be able to operate your supply chain without China. And this pertains to both branded drugs and generic drugs. Next slide, please. A Dutch documentary aired uh, last year and more recently an update version this year. China owns the global raw materials market. This is a quote from a gentleman who worked in the European industry for more than 30 years. Next slide. And he also noted, this is in the Netherlands, we're afraid that China will do things to deprive us of our medicines. So while there might be a trade issues with the United States and China, this is a concern that many countries around the world have. Next slide. How we got here, it's usually, next slide please, it's usually, usually thought that it's China is cheaper because of its labor costs and subsidies to its companies. But in fact, there's something else going on, which we document in China RX, a case study of the closure of the last penicillin plant in the United States. Why did it happen? Because China formed a cartel. It fixed prices and controlled supply to the US and other countries. It has government subsidies and ma manipulates its currency. Next slide, please. This is data from uh, European industry leaders uh, briefly, the bar graphs are global production. The sub bar graphs are Chinese production, again, subsidized by the Chinese government. U.S. companies are effectively competing against the Chinese government, not other companies. And watch that yellow line, which is price. And in 2004, there was a significant drop, and it was in price, global price, and it was kept low for four years. That began in 2004, and that is when the last penicillin plant in the United States announced it was closing because China's predatory trade practices drive out their competitors. And once they gain dominant global market share, prices go back up. Even India's uh, penicillin producers were driven out of business during this time. So India depends on China for penicillin and other antibiotic components. Next slide, please. And this is the pattern for other products. And to understand, this is a, people ask, well, what is this industrial base? What, we, what countries lose is huge infrastructure. The closure of the last penicillin man, plant in the US meant the demolishing of 50 buildings that once produced 70% of the world's supply. 
And so why we have shortages of antibiotics and so much else is because the part of it is the concentration of production in a single country and fewer suppliers. That's just one factor. Next slide, please. What are the risks? We've talked about shortages and interruptions in supply, but I want to close with this 90 second video. This is a retired army colonel who is a commissioner on the US China Economic and Security Review Commission who just mentioned offhand uh, during a hearing on this subject about his own experience about the concerns about quality. As some of you may remember, there were blood pressure medicines recalled um, beginning in July 2018, and, it's, it, and millions of people around the world uh, were adversely affected, including people here. The line of uh, uh, questions and responses uh, just struck me, and uh, I have to say I'm a military retiree. As a consequence, if I take regular prescriptions, I'm required to use express scripts. Yes, they do a great job. Uh, in the past three months, I have had four med blood pressure medications recalled. Uh, when I tracked down the sourcing, they all came out of India, but originally sourced in China. Uh, from four different U.S. Manuf supposed manufacturers, at least providers, companies. Uh, in each case, uh, that particular medication was contaminated with rocket fuel. If you did a little work on the internet, you could figure that out. So <laughs> I know it's not your fault, but I think it's really important that something be done about this by the Department of Defense uh, and the U.S. government in general. The other medication uh, wasn't contaminated with rocket fuel, but again, three recalls in a three-month period. I mean, I imagine active duty people have the same problem, and that affects the readiness of our force. Oh, that's fascinating, rocket fuel. Um, so, Rosemary, let me ask you one question. A uh, quick question, then we'll move on to, on to Sebastian. You were talking about the key starting materials. Um, does China make all of those itself, or is it just consolidated production, taken production from around the country and kind of consolidated it for then, for then re-exporting? Oh, uh, China uh, produces these raw materials and core chemicals. It has a vast, to its credit, it developed a vast industry because if you have 1.3 billion people, you need you know, medicines uh, to care for them. Um, but the manner in which they did it was through um, a lot of unfair trade practices. But China has the dominant uh, uh, production of these core components. And give me, just give me one example of what one of these KSMs is. Uh, there is a chemical molecule that's needed to make a very important antibiotic called ciprofloxacin. Mm -hmm. And that is an anthrax for antidote, an anthrax exposure antidote, and it's used for many other um, uh, purposes in the treatment of uh, infectious disease. Okay. All right. So now we will turn to Sebastian. Sebastian Mirado is a senior trade policy analyst at the OECD Trade and Agricultural Directorate. He's based in Paris, um, and he's going to talk with us about trade interdependencies on in various COVID nineteen goods. He also has a um, slideshow, so Tyler, if you could pull that up, and I'll turn it over to Sebastian. Okay, well, thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the National Press Foundation for, for this uh, invitation. Uh, I have a few, few, a few slides uh, where I would like to share with you some uh, work we have done uh, at OECD uh, on trade uh, in uh, COVID-19 uh, related goods uh, and also on the face mask uh, global value chain. Uh, so what, what we try to do is to gather some data uh, on the goods that were uh, essential to, to fight the coronavirus. We can, we can see the, the next slide. Uh, but to, to, to be clear, the, the goods I'm talking about are really things like the test kits, the, the protective garments, uh, the medical devices, the disinfectants. But my data, for example, do not include pharmaceuticals. Uh, I mean, one reason is that, unfortunately, there is no cure or no treatment for uh, COVID-19. I mean, we can talk later about whether there were some shortages related to some of the medicine uh, that are used. But to be clear, and a difference with the previous presentation is that the data I'm sharing with you now uh, do not cover uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, 
Uh, but if you think about all these uh, protective equipment and goods that, that were really uh, key uh, in uh, fighting the coronavirus, uh, you can see that uh, looking at the uh, global uh, export and the, the top uh, ex exporters, uh, you have five countries that account for uh, about 50% of all exports, uh, and that's uh, Germany, uh, the United States, uh, Switzerland, uh, China, uh, and Ireland. Uh, so not that uh, China is only number four. So if we talk about dependence, uh, most countries would say they depend more uh, on uh, export from Germany, the, U the United States, or Switzerland uh, than uh, China. Uh, then if you look at the, the chart uh, at the bottom, you see also the top uh, importers, and they tend to be uh, the same as the top uh, exporters, but with, with some differences. And you see that the United States almost stand out uh, in terms of the main uh, uh, importer of uh, these uh, COVID-19 uh, related goods with a share of 18%, uh, which may explain some of the uh, debates in the US. But somehow, uh, what we see is that uh, the top uh, importers are also top exporters. So what we have uh, is really what, what we call the intra-industry uh, trade, where countries really specialize in a specific good. So that's what we can see on the uh, next uh, slide. Uh, when we go to, to more detailed data, we will see that the top exporter of a face mask uh, is uh, China. But if we look at intubation kits, the top exporter uh, is the United States. Uh, if we look at uh, gloves, uh, surgical gloves, it's uh, Malaysia and so on. So what we have is that really uh, countries have specialized in specific types of COVID-19 goods uh, and exchange among themselves depend on each other for the provision of these goods. And it's really a world of trade interdependencies where not uh, a single country uh, is able to fully produce all the range of goods uh, you need to fight uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, now, if we move to the next slide, I would like also to, uh, to share with you the, the work we, we have done on, uh, on the face mask global value chain. So first, let me say that uh, I mean, we are lucky to have Gary Gareffi in, in our panel. He's the one who created <laughs> and uh, promoted this type of analysis. And I think it's very useful uh, in the, the context of, of uh, COVID-19 to understand what's going on and to try to, to explain the shortages. So we have identified at least uh, three types of uh, bottlenecks uh, in the face mask uh, value chain. Uh, first, uh, there is an important bottleneck in terms of the supply of uh, a key input. Uh, so the technical name is uh, the melt-blown uh, uh, fabric, uh, which is manufactured with the polypropylene. Uh, it's a key uh, input uh, to uh, manufacture the, the filtering layer uh, in the face mask. Uh, and it's in shortage because it's a, a very uh, technical uh, production uh, technique and you need huge investment to, to produce the specific polymer and the type of uh, fabric uh, needed. Uh, the second bottleneck, it's in the, in the middle of the value chain, really the, the final assembly uh, of this uh, face mask. Uh, so you have many companies uh, that uh, now are, are trying also to, uh, to uh, step in and produce this face mask. Uh, but uh, clearly, there was a shortage which was explained by the, the surge in demand. Uh, so when you ask the manufacturers, they estimate that the, the demand for their production was increased by a factor of maybe 50. Uh, and the main reason why there was a global shortage is, is uh, this surge in demand. Uh, and we, we can come back uh, to this later. But then there were many also bottlenecks at the end of the value chain uh, in the distribution networks. Uh, so of course, in the context of the shortage, uh, these distribution networks, whether they were private or public, was really, uh, were really disorganized and under uh, important stress. Uh, but also you had bottlenecks in the, uh, through some policies because some countries producing face masks started to put uh, export restrictions and it prevented from other countries to, to access uh, this uh, key uh, good. Uh, but I'm happy to, to come back to this uh, uh, during the, the discussion and I will leave it uh, there for my uh, introductory remarks. Thank you. Okay, Sebastian, so um, one quick, Tyler, if you could keep the slideshow up and just go back to the, the slide with the, with the bars, with the, the graphic, with the vertical bars. Just, Sebastian, just a quick question for journalists out there who are looking for data resources. Where, where do these data come from? Is this OEC data or WTO data? Where does it come from? Okay, so, so the source is a, is a trade data set called BASI from a, a French organization called, called CP, but the, this uh, data will be uh, are available 
uh, in the uh, OECD note, uh, and I think you, you have the, the link to download this paper. Let me also say that you had similar, similar work done by uh, uh, WTO and some other international organization. Uh, but so basically what we call the COVID-19 related goods, uh, you have a note, some kind of official list released by the World Customs Organization. So in the trade statistics, they have identified all uh, the goods that were discussed in the context of COVID-19, and we are all using uh, this list. Uh, but let me also say that uh, these data uh, are quite uh, aggregated and, and are, are not always well covering very specific products. So you have some technical issues. I don't have time to, to enter into the detail, but we are all relying on some of the same definition of this COVID-19 good, and you can find different sources with, with uh, this data, and I'm happy to, to, to share some uh, link uh, if uh, people are interested in, in uh, seeing the specific data. Okay, so thank you much. Um, and as uh, uh, Sebastian noted, uh, he wrote a research note on, on the N95 masks, specifically describing the manufacturing process, all the, all the layers that go into the, into the making of those masks. And uh, that's something that after, after today's session, we will have a long list of resources that journalists can use to um, access data sources, other news stories that have been done on these topics, uh, the work of these three experts, and other analyses that are out there that could be helpful for you in, in doing a story. Um, we, have a, we have some questions coming in. Um, we have one more speaker and then we'll have full Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, we will be giving priority to uh, journalists who are on deadline. So if you're on a deadline, let us know. Um, raise your hand so you can ask an audio question. And after we hear from uh, Gary, we will get to those questions. So we have with us now, uh, Gary uh, Jureffi, he's been director of the Global Value Chain Center at Duke University for 15 years. He's also an emeritus professor of sociology. He's going to give us some insights on whether these shortages that we're seeing in things like masks are market failure or a policy failure. So I'll turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good day to everybody. The topic I want to address, I think, will complement uh, the presentations you heard from Rosemary and Sebastian. Uh, and I really want to zero in on this question of reshoring of production as it relates to these medical uh, products. We've been hearing as a result of the uh, uh, significant ramp up in, in demand and the shortages in these products that, that in some ways COVID-19 is actually perhaps the end of globalization as we know it, that the global supply chains have not been able to deal with these kinds of problems. And there's very real dependencies for critical resources as Rosemary pointed out in some of the pharmaceutical cases. So the question is whether reshoring uh, to a country like the US, uh, very large, is going to be a solution to some of these problems. Uh, I believe that domestic production in these uh, medical devices and personal protective equipment is definitely going to increase in the next few years, but that it's not going to displace uh, or replace globalization per se. I think the advantages of international production, trade, uh, and innovation far outweigh the disadvantages, but clearly a, a rebalancing is needed. And I want to highlight in my remarks four issues or, or key objectives that I think uh, are going to shape the reshoring uh, of these products. One has to do with efficiency considerations, particularly cost and availability of these drugs. Second, security. Third, jobs. And fourth, innovation. I think those four factors, efficiency, security, jobs, and innovation, uh, have trade-offs among themselves in terms of what we can expect from reshoring. So let me just give a few examples of each one. Uh, the efficiency considerations uh, boil down in part to low cost. I think low cost is one of the major reasons we've seen this uh, growth of these uh, global supply chains and global production networks. And it's especially important for medical devices. So products like the N95 masks that Sebastian was talking about in normal times cost less than a dollar a mask in terms of how they're produced. And things like 
surgical gloves or medical gowns are also very, very inexpensive in these current global production arrangements. And I think as Sebastian's data showed, uh, each of these products actually comes from a number of different countries that have certain advantages. The problem with the uh, coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic is that the demand escalated, not just in the US, but all around the world to levels that would be uh, sort of unmanageable, uh, unmanage, uh, unimaginable before the pandemic. So the normal supply, for example, of the N95 masks in the US was around 50 million masks a month. And most of those were actually devoted to industrial use, factory workers using the mask to keep out dangerous uh, particles or, or materials in the workplace. Only 15 or 20% were actually for medical use. Well, with the pandemic, the, uh, the demand uh, shot up from 50 million masks a month to 300 million masks a month, and almost all of those for medical use. So one of the problems was the, the ramp up that was required in the supply chain meant that big companies like 3M and Honeywell in the US and smaller suppliers have had to increase production to a billion masks, which is currently what's being supplied from US production and imports and expected to go up to 2 billion by the uh, end of, the, uh, of 2020. But a problem in this ramp up is, is that the complexity of these products is actually very substantial from a supply chain point of view. So if you look at the N95 masks, there's 70 different parts that are needed to make the N95 masks, and only some of those are in the US. If you look at ventilators, there's 300 parts. So part of the issues that we need to deal with from a supply chain point of view is the US could focus on particular critical components, but realistically, it can't expect to bring the entire supply chain for all of these products inside the US. So I think we still have to manage these efficiency problems through some kinds of international arrangements, even if we could increase production for some critical products in the US in the short term. That brings me to a, the second main topic, which is security. I think one of the main arguments uh, in favor of reshoring or, or domestic production is you could increase the security of essential products. Uh, and in the case of the medical devices and pharmaceuticals industry, that's clearly an area where we could imagine that there are a number of key products uh, for healthcare needs. And one of the ways you can increase supply is through stockpiles. That's one of the arguments we already, we have an, uh, a national stockpile of key products, but there's a few key problems with stockpiles. I mean, one of them was alluded to actually in Rosemary's presentation. Even if you take a particular class of drugs like antibiotics, there's many, many types of antibiotics that have different uses. So, and the number of active pharmaceutical ingredients, which is what you really want to focus on to create the medicines itself is very large. So one problem is if we're going to create stockpiles, we'd have to determine which drugs are really essential. Uh, secondly, uh, we have to know how large the stockpiles can be. Third, there's a problem of technology lock-in. If we create stockpiles, even of the N95 masks, we introduce the technology at the time we create the stockpile that will continue to change. Uh, and finally, stockpiles degrade over time. So you have to have a way of using stockpiles if you're going to build them up. Uh, third topic, I'll be quick on this, is jobs. Two minutes. And, uh, thank you. And, and the jobs front, you know, Robert Lighthouser, U.S. Trade Representative, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times recently about whether the uh, era of outsourcing of U.S. jobs is over. And so there's a big concern about bringing production back to create more U.S. jobs. But one problem is that most manufacturing nowadays has become increasingly automated. There's fewer jobs, and the jobs that exist require higher skills. So almost every industry that might have moved offshore from the U.S. or other advanced industrial countries over the last 15, 20 years has become more automated, more skilled. So to bring it back isn't going to solve the jobs problem in numbers, but it is going to create an issue in terms of skills. Let me come back to the, the final point of innovation, which I think is a really critical one for the U.S. economy. And the question is, can reshoring or bringing production back help with innovation? And there's, there's some ways it can. So, for example, in ventilators, uh, the U.S. government issued contracts to try to create 
lower cost ventilators that could be made in the US. And in fact, they gave an award back around 2011, 2012 to a startup company that could produce, that, that was going to develop a US ventilator for $3,000 per ventilator instead of the normal price of 10,000. And they came up with such a ventilator uh, through the government contract. Problem was that this company got bought up in a phase of industry consolidation by a much larger company. And that larger company did not want to release the lower cost ventilator because it would undercut its more profitable products. So one problem with market competition is even if we create some incentives for innovation, it's not clear that you can force that distribution unless the government plays a very active role in keeping that out there. But I just wanna mention two final topics. Vaccines is probably the biggest area of R&D right now in this field because everybody knows that creation of vaccines is what you would need to stop the pandemic. I think there's a global innovation race for vaccines. There is no way that any one country or even any one company in a country is going to control that. So I think we need to have the innovation on that side be uh, international. Once the vaccine's discovered, the production is going to be a massive undertaking. It'll probably have to take place in many countries around the world, close to where demand is largest. So for vaccines, production isn't the, the, the most profitable part of it. It's the finding of the vaccine and patenting it. Final example, my last point, testing. Surprisingly, in, in a sort of a global value chain world, one of the simpler products has become one of the toughest problems, which is the testing kits. And we've heard in the US how simple things like cotton swabs or chemical reagents aren't available, so the whole kit isn't created. Well, we just had an announcement two weeks ago that a new one hour test for uh, antibodies uh, for COVID-19 was produced by National University of Singapore in collaboration with Duke University and a joint program they have. Uh, I think it seems like it's gonna have a lot of potential, but I raise that as an example that innovation is got to be international because there's so many uh, different uh, universities and companies working on this, but once we have the innovation, we can probably bring some of that production back to the US. So I wanted to just uh, emphasize with these remarks that the, the trade-offs between efficiency, security, jobs, innovation, all of them can favor some kinds of production back in the US, but it can't be covering the full range of these products. So I think some kind of international production and trade is still going to be important in order to assure the uh, uh, availability of these products for COVID-19 and any crises that arise down the road. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Gary. So well, let's let's turn to some questions. Um, again, if you want to ask a question, look down to the bottom of your screen and, and raise your hand, um, or you can. And so we'll ask. Have you asked the question by audio, or you can write your question in. Uh, the first question is going to be an audio question uh, to Jillian Deutsch of Politico. Tyler, if you could unmute her, and we will turn the floor over to to Jillian. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really curious about um, safety checks and supply chains because right now, obviously, governments are trying to acquire face masks and ventilators as quickly as possible. You know, they're trying to get car manufacturers to produce, produce ventilators. I'm wondering if you're, you're seeing, though, that there are any safety risks in trying to get people who are not specialized in, in producing these kinds of, of um, equipment um, or if you're seeing even you know, tests getting you know, being put on the market too quickly because they're not being checked by the proper authorities. I could maybe make a quick uh, comment on that one. I think that the, uh, the fact that all of these products are pretty highly regulated introduces some checks on, on the safety uh, side of this. And I think if you can get experienced manufacturers like car makers, they would work closely with regulatory authorities probably to make sure that the, the products uh, meet standards, but it turns out that there's surprising liability issues with the N95 mask in particular that I think have created some, some problems. So for example, the industrial masks that were made by companies like 3M, the largest producer of the N95 masks, uh, don't have a permeable filter that would keep liquids out, which is critical to use it as a medical mask. And so while there U.S. government was trying to ramp up production of these masks, there was a three to four week delay 
while the liability issue was getting sorted out because sorted out because the industry for a long while had not wanted to uh, upgrade or transform the the uh, industry mask into the medical mask without some kind of liability waiver. So I think this this points to the complexity of that quality problem. There are quality standards, there's regulations, but in actually trying to meet them, you sometimes can run up against uh, tricky legal issues uh, and other things that the manufacturers have to be paying attention to. So we need strong regulation for sure. Okay, uh, Rosemary, are there, do you have any thoughts about um, FDA oversight of the pharmaceutical quality process? Uh, yes, thank you, Chris. Well, the FDA has uh, removed inspectors from countries around the world because of the uh, COVID situation to protect federal employees. And so that means that our medicines and their components that are being made in countries around the world are uh, not under, are not being regulated. And the FDA is not uh, set up to test every batch of product before it sells it. Uh, you know, in the um, masks issue, you may, some of you may have seen that 65 masks, 65 companies in China that were making masks for the United States, they didn't meet standards. They were tested after the fact. And that was just to meet demand. And they were found that they were not uh, protecting um, healthcare workers and the public. A challenge is companies that make products here in the U.S. Are, can be held liable. But if we have imported products, from certain countries, it's very hard to hold them accountable. So the variation in liability, uh, but that, uh, that said, it sh uh, the public should expect high quality products and enforcement of that, no matter where they come from. And that's a challenge, particularly when surge capacity and demand uh, is so enormous. Okay, thanks. So we have another audio question from uh, Diana Pulver, um, who is with USA Today's Regional Investigative unit based out of Florida, I believe. Um, Dinah, we will unmute you and you can ask your question. I have so many questions, but I think the first one is a, a little more information about the 70 parts that are in an N95 mask, because that number just kind of blows you away. Yeah, and sorry, so that has been, maybe Sebastian, you wanna, you wanna comment on that since you've done the case study. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you have to think, so what we call the, the N95 respirator is, a, is also a piece of cloth. Uh, so it's like the surgical mask, uh, but it has some shape to, to cover the mouth and the nose. So, so here, uh, I mean, you, are, you have like three layers. Uh, and the difference with the surgical mask is that these layers go through some high pressure, high temperature rollers uh, to mold the mask and to, to give this uh, shape. But maybe you were talking more about the... Uh, the, uh, the ventilators, which are like a, a mechanical piece of equipment with a lot of uh, inputs and parts and, and uh, components. But otherwise, what we call the N95 respirator is uh, one higher grade quality of, uh, of the surgical mask, mask and it's part of the face mask. Uh, but then you have these more complex machines like the ventilators with lots of parts and components coming from different countries. Okay. Okay. You have one more. Follow up there, no, Diana? No, just come back to me later. <laughs> sure, will do. Okay, so we have a, a question um, from Shannon Teo, who is the um, Malaysia Bureau Chief for the Straits Times. Um, and uh, Shannon asks, uh, there's an ongoing race to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, but given China controls production of most pharma reagents, does this give them a leverage no matter who comes up with the actual vaccine formula? Uh, Rosemary or, or Gary, do you have thoughts on that? Rosemary. Hi, thank you, Gary, and thank you, Chris. Thanks you for the question. It's true. If you control the core components to make a vaccine, that certainly gives you an advantage um, and monopoly potential mo monopoly position over the manufacturer of it. Mm -hmm. And how big of a problem is that for us? It's huge. You know, we can't make any on the aside from vaccines. You know, infectious diseases can be bacterial in nature, and we need generic antibiotics, the mainline ones. And we can't make that. We can't make antibiotics anymore. We can't make the antibiotics for pneumonia, strep throat, bronchitis, um, tr to treat sepsis. We depend on China largely for those core chemicals, as does the world. Uh, so it's a it's a very very difficult situation for uh, products that are potentially life saving. Mm 
Okay. Um, now we have a question from Valerie Diamond, who is uh, from Healthcare Business News. For hospital system supply chains in the U.S., especially those operating in COVID-19 hotspots, do you have any recommendations, alternative supply sources, et cetera, for treating and protecting patients and themselves right now? Well, I'll just uh, jump in on that. Sure. You know, I, th I think we need to look at the just-in-time delivery system that distributors have, have used for many years. And so hospitals would get, you know, shipments of gloves and other protective gear in normal times every two days when things were operating normally. But when we have the current situation with multiple um, things happening, that system just doesn't work anymore. Uh, so um, per Gary's point, at a minimum level, we might need some minimum level of self-sufficiency in manufacturing of these products at a time when you have a global pandemic 100 countries affected, we're all competing for the same products, and 75 countries have banned exports of medicines and or supplies. So um, we've got to really look at that whole supply chain and what were the failure points, and certainly how those products are distributed uh, is a key factor. Could I just follow up on the just-in-time uh, part of the uh, answer? Because I think part of what just-in-time production had has created is a system that uses low inventories, as low as possible. And so even some of the big manufacturers are arguing that to keep the supply chains lean, they don't want to have stockpiles or inventories, but that's been especially true for hospitals. Hospitals have been under such cost containment pressures that the idea of building up inventories meant for them less money to be used on other uh, products. And so I think that the the trade-off again here is just in time isn't just a production system, it's a financial system. And hospitals have been doing a lot of this low inventory management as a way to try to cut costs, but then that doesn't prepare them or us or for this kind of surge in an industry. And a lot of the surges or crises used to be localized in particular places. It might be because of a natural disaster or a weather problem or a particular country this pandemic has created a global surge, so it's made, meant that this entire system has become particularly vulnerable to disruptions because just in time can't work on either the supply side or on the purchasing side from the point of view of hospitals. If I can just add one, one quick point to that, you know, the strategic national stockpile run by the federal government, it was, it was never meant to supply the entire commercial supply of what hospitals need. It was meant, as Gary was alluding, to regional events like a Hurricane Sandy or a Hurricane Maria. It was not meant to be able to restock our whole healthcare system or even in hot spots. So we have to rethink this. And one of the things I'm thinking about is, and I did speak to a hospital senior leader and they do have their own stockpile. And we you know these are multi-billion dollar enterprises and I, I think we need a rethinking of that to be for them to be able to have supplies on hand, maybe a shared, you know, if, they, if you're a hospital system with 10, 12 hospitals in a, in a region, it would make sense to do that because we just can't rely on the federal government in the context of a global pandemic. Okay. So uh, we are next going to take an audio question from Ruth Reeder, who is from Fast Company. Um, Tyler, if you can unmute, unmute Ruth and Ruth, the floor is yours now. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, so one thing I wanted to, I'm curious to get your thoughts on is that, you know, manufacturers in this, uh, drug manufacturers in, in, in a pandemic have shifted a lot of their energy towards making COVID related, um, whether that's vaccines or drugs or, you know, um, uh, Basically, the whole model shifts to that, to serving that, to serving that pandemic. Um, and that means that other drugs are made less, um, and sometimes the access to those drugs is compromised, right? So, like, there has been, a sh especially if we're talking about, like, hydroxychloroquine, which was thought to be uh, a potential uh, support for this disease, but that means that people who suffer from like malaria then can't get it. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are from a supply chain perspective on like, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you ensure that like other medications can still get to people who need them 
even when manufacturing resources shift to, to deal with a pandemic? Uh, I'll take a, a stab at that, Ruth. Uh, one of the um, points that I've been advocating in my testimony to Congress is that we have the capability to stockpile not just the finished drugs, but the active ingredients, which are the, th again, the things that make medicines medicines. And when we have a global pandemic or even a regional um, situation that requires um, that we have more product, that if we stockpile the API, we can set up manufacturing facilities, you know, real close by. And within weeks, we can start producing the finished drug because making the finished product is a lot easier than making the active ingredient. A challenge is, of course, which drugs, because there are so many, but I think we could, there certainly, there has been a list. The memo has been written on those critical medicines that healthcare organizations need to function uh, in the best of times and certainly during a pandemic. So there might be some creative ways to do that. And the reality is, um, I don't think we will, in a pandemic, avert all shortages, but I do believe that there are means to be able to mitigate them with uh, planning ahead. We, we plan better for you know, hurricanes than we do for certainly our medicine supply. So I think the COVID-19, if there's a silver lining, it's making us you know, re-question not only our supply chains, manufacturing capability, but innovation in what we do. If I can add a, sure. a, 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 on this, my impression is that the, the pharmaceutical industry was maybe better prepared in the sun. Most of the shortages we have discussed were more related to ventilators, face masks, and not for the drugs. So of course, you can say it's because uh, there was not like a, a single drug that was suddenly uh, discovered as very efficient against the coronavirus, but we know that uh, there was uh, some tension on, on some painkillers, uh, on some anesthetics, I mean, the, the drugs that are used to sedate people in anti intensive care units. Uh, and somehow, uh, even if, uh, if you look across countries, there were sometimes some difficulties. I think the, the pharmaceutical in industry was rather well organized. And one lesson is that uh, even during the pandemic, it was able not only uh, to provide the medicines that were used uh, to deal with the COVID-19 patients, but, but also uh, uh, other patients. And we, uh, in what we have studied, we haven't seen similar shortages uh, in the case of pharmaceuticals. Okay, so let me ask, well, we have some audio questions in the queue and some uh, text questions. Let me take a question now um, from Patricia Vallone. Uh, governors across the U.S. are secretly purchasing PPE and medical equipment to prevent getting outbid by other states um, or having it confiscated by the federal government. Talk about the short and long-term ramifications of this and are any other countries doing the same thing? Maybe I could just take a, make an initial comment on that. To me, one of the, the biggest surprises of the COVID uh, pandemic in the US was how inadequate our, our, our distribution and allocation system was. Even when the supplies started coming in, the fact that all 50 states and big municipalities in them had different kinds of demand profiles ended up creating this very chaotic situation where it appeared that some states were getting favorite, you know, were, were, were getting supplies quicker than others. I think, I, maybe it was, I think, Rosemary that mentioned that I think increasingly what we're starting to see from the bottom up is states beginning to say that they can pool their capacity the same way hospitals might, so that if you got eight or 10 states that together were in a certain region of the country and they were starting to work to decide how to, uh, pool their their orders or bids, I think that will end up being a much uh, more stable situation going forward than 50 individual states and trying to keep track of that. But I think that distribution side is critical. It's not just a supply side problem. It's an allocation problem. And that requires having a system in place to hear what all the states and big cities are uh, requiring and then figuring out a very sophisticated logistics or coordination method and if we could group some of that demand by states getting together or hospitals getting together i think that would uh, make the system a bit more efficient i'll just add i think that should also be done for private sector hospitals that themselves were scrambling there was huge competition to get ppe and some of them were going outside their distribution uh, distributors others felt compelled to stay with their distributors and that created shortages 
So I'd love to see some investigative reporting. We've heard a lot more about the, you know, the, what the governors and states and the issues they've had. I'd love to see some investigative reporting on what was going on with hospitals and how their allocation and supply chains were disrupted and the impact that had on patients. So let's go to a uh, audio question from Andrew Green, who is a European-based freelancer for The Lancet and other publications. Um, Andrew, you're unmuted and you can ask your question. Great, thanks very much. Uh, my question is for Rosemary. I'm wondering if you could uh, kind of expand on something you were talking about earlier. Does Chinese control of active ingredients mean that they could potentially override countries' attempts to use compulsory licenses under TRIPS agreements, TRIPS flexibilities? Are you talking about the compulsory licenses for branded products, Andrew? Yes, exactly. So if, you know, potentially like you had a hypothetical scenario where a Chinese manufacturer comes up with a vaccine and then a country tries to claim a compulsory license and they, China just essentially says we won't even make active ingredients available to you so you can, you can make a generic version of it. Well, I, I think that is a very real possibility. I'm hearing reports, very credible reports, not for the branded products. And just so everybody under, uh, has a clear picture of this, 90% of the medicines we take are generic. Only 10% are branded, that's in the US. And uh, China has a, a, you know, a real dominant market share of these core components generally. And for those generic antibiotics, I'm hearing reports that China is telling its companies not to send uh, antibiotic material to the United States. So uh, it certainly is the case that uh, China could do that for the branded products under compulsory licenses, as well as for the generic products. This is what happens when you have a global monopoly and or close to or close to a monopoly. And that's, you know, I see this as, you know, oil. We wouldn't have 80 or 90% of the world's oil concentrated in a single country. And we wouldn't have 80 or 90% of the world's wheat or corn supply concentrated in a single country. So I think we do need some diversification and I hope that's a lesson from uh, COVID-19. Okay, so we'll have, we have about five or so minutes. Um, I see some hands up of people who, uh, have already asked a question. If you are, if your hand's up for a follow up, you know, keep it up. If you uh, don't have another question, you know, drop your hand. Um, so, uh, but this question is a text question from Kat Lucero from MLEX. Uh, for all panelists, do you think the US tariffs on COVID 19 related goods made in China was a major cause of the limited supply of those supplies in the US? I think there uh, a lot of the products that were initially proposed for tariffs uh, did not have tariffs. I, I think we have, I, I think global demand and concentration of production in a single country uh, are far much more overriding issues. I would agree. Okay. Um, we'll go to an audio question um, back to Jillian Deutsch from Politico. Uh, we will get you unmuted. And uh, the floor should be yours here in a second, Jillian. Okay, Jillian, the floor is yours. Hi, so yeah, I was also just curious whether, um, this is kind of follow up to the last question, whether the EU's export controls really had major impacts on, on other countries when it came to supplying um, protective gear and face masks. Maybe Sebastian might know something about that one. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it's difficult to, to say uh, what, what was the impact, but, but, but for sure, um, I mean, you, you have a, a few, I mean, to, to be clear, many countries have, have put in place uh, export restrictions, but not all of them are producers of these goods. And one motivation for, for this uh, export restriction is often hoarding and uh, reselling. So what uh, countries don't want is, is that some uh, masks, for example, they have imported are resold at a, a higher price. So uh, they want these masks to be for, for their citizens. But now it's also clear that some main manufacturers uh, are in Europe and uh, so there are export restrictions for countries uh, uh, outside the, the EU. There was also for certain types of goods uh, uh, an export ban 
uh, in the US, even uh, if some uh, exemption. So it's clear that uh, some countries, particularly in the developing world, uh, have been uh, impacted by, by these export bans. And what has happened, for example, in the case of face masks, is that now everybody is relying on China. So China at the beginning, I mean, China never had some kind of export ban, but let's say in January, February, uh, when it was the height of the uh, coronavirus crisis in China, the, the masks were first for the domestic market, uh, and there were no uh, export. Uh, but uh, China has uh, so much increased its production of face masks, uh, according to some data, it has been multiplied by 12, that now it's really the main exporter. So uh, for at least for the face mask, uh, everybody can now access the Chinese mask, which is also interesting in this discussion we had before on the domestic supply, because uh, for many goods now, people rely on the global value chain. So now, uh, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, and it was a concern with the concentration, like half of the masks were coming from China, but maybe now it's 90 percent. And there was also, I think, a question on test kits. Uh, you have many countries, and in particular, Korea uh, has uh, become one uh, of the main exporters of COVID-19 test kits. Uh, and again, you can think, because the test kits, it's not so, so difficult to produce domestically, but uh, the question is why some countries, including the U.S., prefer to import these uh, test kits from Korea and rely on global value chains rather than developing uh, this domestic capacity. So clearly, uh, you have uh, some uh, companies, and it's uh, related to, to their agility, their capacity in the middle of the crisis to source the input and to, to serve uh, all uh, countries. Uh, some, some countries have become successful in uh, exporting during the crisis uh, the, these goods and now, uh, thanks to them, somehow, uh, despite the export restrictions put in place by the EU or the US, uh, these goods tend to be available. Uh, but uh, clearly, we could be in a situation where it would not be the case. It's also because uh, of the difference uh, in the timing of how countries were impacted uh, by COVID-19, but if tomorrow we have a second wave, or uh, if it's more the developing world, uh, as we start to see, uh, we, we could be in a situation where uh, it's, uh, these export restrictions could really become a, a, an issue for the countries not producing any of these COVID-19 goods, because I talk about interdependencies, uh, but these interdependencies are mostly between the OECD countries that were on my slides. Uh, but you have also a lot of developing countries uh, that have no capacity in most of the, the goods that I, I've talked about. And for them, they really depend on trade. And for them, the export restrictions could be really a, a big issue in the future. Okay. So we have a question here from Teresa Young of The Straits Times. She's the DC correspondent for The Straits Times. President Trump repeatedly says he wants to reshore the pharmaceutical industry to the US. How feasible is this given its overwhelming dependence on China for raw materials and core chemicals right now? What do you think of his push? Uh, Rosemary, thoughts? Sure, well, uh, there's a, we have empty and mothballed plants, drug manufacturing plants here in the United States. And uh, they can be uh, started up. We still have the skilled workforce to do that. And once you create demand for the finished goods and the active ingredients made here, then you can gradually uh, create demand for some of the key starting materials produced here. Yep. This uh, shift took 30 years and it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think identifying the most critical medicines that are essential for the functioning of a healthcare system, um, it's, it's very feasible to do it. And I don't think any country has an option. So the United States doesn't have an option to do that, not to do it. Gary, quick thought on that? Yeah, just a quick uh, point. I, th I think the last uh, comment Rosemary said is, is also very important. We have to choose among a large number of products, those that are really most essential. Uh, but secondly, some of the newer pharmaceutical companies are actually using advanced manufacturing methods and different ways of developing these products. So there was just a $350 million grant issued a couple of weeks ago to a Virginia-based startup company that is using uh, advanced manufacturing methods to produce a variety of generic uh, uh, pharmaceutical active ingredients. So I think that's another thing we need to be exploring in the US, not just the old ways of making these products, but some new, new ways that could give companies uh, more flexibility perhaps in producing a greater range of these active ingredients. And some of that seems to be uh, coming online. 
Okay, so we're gonna, I think I just got time for two, two fairly uh, quick uh, text questions. We've gone a couple minutes over, but as long as the, the speakers are willing, we'll, we'll get these questions in. Um, uh, this is for you, uh, Rosemary, I would think. Uh, for clarity, are the core materials naturally occurring in China or are these man-made chemicals where the production facilities are based in China? In other words, does China rely on other countries for its core materials in order to make base chemicals? Uh, my understanding is that they are uh, the production source. Okay. And final question um, from Shannon Teo of Straits Times uh, is dealing with test kits uh, here in Malaysia um, and in the ASEAN region, places like Indonesia and the Philippines. There's been a situation about whether we were able to test aggressively enough given the need to produce test kits. Is there data about the trade of these test kits and are you have much to say about the kind of bottlenecks of that supply chain, Gary? Uh, I think that the uh, that test kit innovation I happened to mention coming from NUS Duke, I know they're planning on uh, exporting that uh, as uh, quickly as possible. So I think some exporting is occurring, but typically it's the, the test kits are probably assembled in the place that they're being used. So you don't necessarily export whole kits, but again, maybe Sebastian has some information on the trade side for the test kits. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, it, it, it's difficult to, to get data because you have like, you have like a, a, a global industry, which is an in vitro diagnostic, but it covers many different types of, uh, of uh, tests. Uh, and the one that are specific to COVID-19 is difficult, but according to some data, now the main uh, exporters are clearly China, uh, South Korea, uh, and uh, Switzerland. So my impression is that uh, it's not difficult at this stage uh, to get these uh, test kits, even if you know all countries have tried to increase the number, the number of tests, uh, but the scaling up in this industry uh, was maybe easier in the sense that uh, it's not too, compl I mean, you have the issue of sourcing some reagents and uh, it, it's an issue for specific countries, but the manufacturing process is, is not so difficult and can be uh, reproduced easily. So like South Korea, uh, man, you manage to produce uh, millions of test kits per, per day and so clearly they, they don't have an issue in, in sourcing the, the input. So I would say test, is, uh, test kits are okay at this stage. 